And unlike Kerouac's work with Alan, Nordine's trained voice and expert delivery meant that he could control the effect of his surreal vignettes to create a far more immersive experience. Inflection is, is a, a marvelous thing in speaking. But sometimes when people read, they lose that. It's more dramatic to, to make it seem like it's coming out of your mind as of the moment. That's why when I recite something that I've, that I've written, I know exactly what the beats are. Uh, there's a very interesting 10787 rhythm in Messy, 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 Mr. Blister. Uh, that's 10 lines, 10 beats. But I know what the words are. Messy, 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 Mr. Blister. Fidgeting dumb in his smart. Hiding his ho-hum in ha-ha. Where does his silliness start? See him where his silly self goes hee-hee. That's a 10-beat line. Flims of his flam telling lies. Slow motion deep in his inside. Giggles he foxily sly as the world goes around and around and around, as the world goes around and around. And Nordine's very unique brand of spoken word jazz would be a defining inspiration on Waite's own work in the same field. I think it was hugely influential on Waite's in, in different phases of his career. You know, and ultimately he ends up working with Ken Nordine, who is a survivor, uh, unlike so many other of the influences that we're talking about with, with Tom Waits, who are either dead or past their creative peak by the time he comes on the scene. But, uh, you know, Ken Nordine is still going strong. A lot of the things that uh, Waits draws on, including Ken Nordine, ultimately originate with jazz because the jazz sensibility, you know, you know and or the beat sensibility, you know, was the first real, you know, resistance to, um, you know, American cultural, you know, hegemony, if you like, um, that just said, no, we're going to drop out from this, you know, and so there is a sort of, there's a dropout sensibility there. Um, which is a common to all the things that influence Waits. You know, when when he was trying to find his um, creative identity. Some people have tried to link me with the uh, Beat Generation, with uh, Howell, with Allen Ginsberg, Allen, uh, and the whole entourage. They, they had so much angst. I, I've, my angst is a little disguised. It's uh, more uh, uh, whistling at a at a wake. Uh, kind of it's, it's uh, they're, they're stories, but they're they're uh, more influenced by Kafka and that type of uh, insular, circular thinking that he was so good at. There are elements of his work that very much tie in with the beats and uh, with with jazz and so on and so forth. But there's something quite separate going on in his writing as well, which is, uh, which is far more enigmatic uh, and, and, and possibly more, more European. And I think he was influenced by writers like Kafka. Um, and that is one of the reasons, I think, that he's been an enduring influence on Tom Waits' work. That when Tom moves on, if you like, from the beat influence, uh, Ken Nordin as an influence is able to move on with him. Tom Waits' early spoken word things are rather too tumultuous to really detect an obvious Nordin influence. They're, they're much more uh, beat literature influenced. And by the time he's doing spoken word pieces like uh, The Ocean Doesn't Want Me and um, What's he building in there? Uh, these these uh, are, are virtual Nordine pastiches. What's he building in there? What the hell is he building in there? He has subscriptions to those magazines. He never waves when he goes by. He's hiding something from the rest of us. He's all to himself. I think I know why. This 
brilliant satire of, of suburban paranoia and, 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 uh, and prejudice. And funny as well. Now, and that is pure Nordine. How you can be satirical, philosophical and funny with these haiku-like lines. That's pure Nordine. I like Tom very much. He's, I think he's got a wonderful charisma. Uh, I have the feeling that he does things that I don't have to do now. And in his constant search for artists whose work sparked his own imagination, during his 1970s career at Asylum Records, Waits was not only looking to the past for inspiration. A writer who had begun to emerge at the tail end of the 1960s and whose work strongly attracted the young singer-songwriter was Charles Bukowski. A German-born poet, novelist, and short story writer whose family had moved to California when he was a child, Bukowski's cynical and yet poignant and philosophical writing was rooted in the same forgotten neighborhoods of Los Angeles that were the locale of so much of Waite's own work. Bukowski's early life was that he was born in Germany, the son of a soldier, came to Los Angeles when his dad came back from the war, the First World War, grew up in L.A., suburban L.A., lower middle class, um, had this traumatic childhood whereby dad abused him and he had this traumatic case of acne which completely disfigured him in an in exceptional way and that caused him to be a little bit maladjusted and then fell into this odd bohemian life in Los Angeles, in downtown Los Angeles, living in rooming houses, drinking a lot, writing, you know, he was a born writer, right from the start he was writing like writers do, knocking out little stories and poems in his bed sit or his room in his hotel in downtown LA, drinking a lot, very lonely, uh, had no girlfriends because he felt himself to be physically repulsive, so he had no sexual experience and became this sort of misanthropic loner. In the early 1940s, Bukowski went out on the road in search of experience while continuing to write. He had his first sexual encounter at age 24, as well as the first publication of one of his short stories. Yet upon his return to L.A., the constant rejections of magazines and publishers led him into years of obscurity within the world of blue-collar labor. Bukowski embarks on a series of menial jobs, really, factory jobs, what he would call shit jobs or you know, rubbishy jobs, working in factories, working not in shops, but in hotels, department stores, uh, loading bays of uh, art companies. And most famously, he works for the post office in L.A., uh, hates it, absolutely despises it, you know, feels it's beneath him intellectually, uh, but he doesn't make any money from his writing, so he has to do it. And all this time, he writes as a hobby. Post office was a hard gig, you know. I'd work all night, you know, 11 years clerking. Then I had to write, get up and start drinking and writing, then go to work. Same thing, get up, drink and write. Employed by the Los Angeles Postal Service throughout the 1960s, towards the end of the decade, his fortunes began to change, and his work reached a wider audience through the underground newspapers that were flourishing at the height of the counterculture. He starts to write autobiographical short stories about his own life for the Los Angeles Free Press. It was well read in Los Angeles in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, it was very funny. It was about Bukowski as a kind of... Uh, this, this misanthropic, reclusive, heavy drinking, uh, self-deprecating uh, sort of troll, really, living in East Hollywood in this apartment building. And then this guy called John Martin comes along. Uh, he's a businessman, a T 